Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. We need to reimagine what this food system could look like. We have to grab the potential of food to transform our lives, our towns, our cities, our communities, and our planet. And it's not just about realizing potential, it's an absolute necessity for our future. It's all alive. It's all connected. It's all intelligent. It's all relatives. We stand at the threshold of a historic opportunity in the human experiment to reimagine how to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. It's a revolution from the heart of nature and the human heart. In this series, The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature, we celebrate social and scientific innovators with breakthrough solutions for restoring people and planet, creating a future environment of hope. If you are what you eat, in the U.S., you might be sad. That's S-A-D, the standard American diet. You might be a pillar of salt, abundantly greased, sugar-coated, with a disturbingly long shelf life courtesy of artificial preservatives. The sad bill gets delivered to the groaning U.S. healthcare system, many of whose troubles start in the kitchen or more likely at fast food counters or endless processed foods aisles. First, this story gets worse, then it gets better. As climate disruption unleashes global weirding, our industrial farming systems are among the most vulnerable casualties of today's wild weather extremes and rapidly shifting patterns. And by the way, our food system itself is contributing mightily to the climate crisis as humanity's single most destructive activity against nature. The real yield of today's agribusiness monopolies and extreme wealth inequality is a deeply unfair food system. Tens of millions have little access to quality food or to enough food. Now the story gets better. There's a renaissance of healthy, fair food systems emerging in the U.S. today. They come in many forms, but the common thread is community. People are banding together to seed a new food culture and develop practices that prize health and build equity. These remarkable innovators are reimagining new models for local food security, self-determination, justice, and food so good that it's medicine. And training young people is at the center. It's anything but sad. This is a nourishing future, creating a just and healthy food system with Malik Yakini of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, Catherine Couch, director of the Series Community Project, and Oren Hesterman of the Fair Food Network. My name is Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. I'm a child of the 1960s and the early 1970s, and probably most of you know the 60s was a time of great turmoil in some senses in this country, where many of the values were being questioned, and there was this revolutionary consciousness that developed. And so I am unapologetically a product of that time period. Malik Yakini is co-founder and executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. He says the food movement to build self-reliance, food security, and social and economic justice is inextricably connected with many other inequities African Americans and people of color have long faced. The burdens of history, of white supremacy and racism, still haunt current reality. There's a kind of ghost in the machine that too few see, and his own awakening came as a shock. Malik Yakini spoke at a Bioneers conference. One of the figures in the 60s that had a profound influence on me is Malcolm X. When I was in the eighth grade in 1969, a teacher played the entire LP record of a speech called Message to the Grassroots. But in this speech, Malcolm X talked about food on the slave plantations, the plantations on which enslaved Africans worked. 
he said that there were two kinds of slaves, the house slave and the field slave. And he said that the house slave ate what they call high up on the hog. They ate more of the food that was similar to the master's food. The field slaves ate the kind of worst food, the food that was cast off that the masters didn't want. So of the pig, they ate the snout and the feet and the tail. In fact, there's an old saying in the black community that black folks used to eat everything but the oink. But so this had a profound influence on me because Malcolm X said, in those days, we were gut eaters. And he said, some of y'all are still gut eaters. And so he really kind of shook my mind because up to that point, I hadn't really thought about food within a social or historical context. I had only thought about food in terms of whether or not I liked the way it tasted and when I could get some more. And so I started to think about food more critically within this larger context of society. And I started to make changes in my diet personally. And then later, I started to learn about this, what we're calling the food movement, and seeing how it intersects with these other movements for justice in the society. Malik Yakini's hometown of Detroit is a classic case history of how food intertwines with persistent economic and social inequalities. During the 1950s, Detroit residents enjoyed a vibrant economy and employment driven by the auto industry. Then, with corporate deindustrialization and globalization, business largely abandoned the city, and the tax base vaporized with it. Since then, redlining and other discriminatory policies have short-circuited access to healthy food for Detroit's black population, nearly 85 percent of the city's residents. Malik Yakini has been working to bypass Detroit's failing food system altogether. The vision of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is to ensure access to healthy foods with dignity and respect for all Detroit's residents by building an alternative food economy. That's the real story coming out of Detroit today. Malik Yakini says it starts with dispelling the burdens of history held by the black community about agriculture itself. We have a particular problem in the African-American community, and I, I found also from talking to some Latinas that it's not unique to the African-American community, but because of our historical experience, many of us see agriculture in a very negative way. But in the African-American community in particular, because of the experiences of enslavement and sharecropping, we often see agriculture as a system that exploits our labor in order to make others wealthy. So there's many people in the black community that are trying to run as far from agriculture as they can. And so part of our work is to reframe agricultural work and to build a new cadre of people who are dedicated to farming. And so we're also, in addition to the crops we're growing, we're growing new farmers. The network engages the Detroit community in a wide range of projects, such as D-Town Farm. On seven acres inside a city-owned park, they extend the growing season with enclosed hoop houses. Off-the-grid solar energy provides the power. They water their crops with rainwater. They store in a retention pond and run through drip irrigation. They raise bees to pollinate the crops and produce honey. And they've established a large-scale composting operation. But that's just the beginning of what long-term food security looks like. We also do uh, quite a bit of agritourism, and we're exposing people to urban agriculture. So our farm is a production farm and a learning institution. So we have hundreds and perhaps thousands of people who visit our farm each year. The second of our programs is called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program. That functions at three sites in the city of Detroit, and we're dealing with young people between the ages of 5 and 12. We're teaching them about creating raised bed gardens, about food justice, about nutrition, and about the importance of exercise. But we're, we're growing new farmers because we know it's absolutely necessary that this be an intergenerational movement. We have a new program that we implemented this summer called Food and Flavor. And so this program is dealing with young people who are 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, and they also are creating gardens, but they're taking the things they grow in those gardens and creating value-added products and selling them. And so at our Harvest Festival, we had six of the young people from that program come out and sell uh, bread and butter pickles that they had made. And each one of them went home with $30 in their pocket, in addition to the $50 stipend that they get each week. So they were thrilled. And so we're, we're making the connection between agriculture and the ability to make a living. Malik Yakini says this intergenerational work is growing not only food, it's growing consciousness and agency. 
that same next generation of inspired young food system pathfinders committed to social justice is rising across the country, such as in California. You know, when I first started series, the number one question that I got was, how do you recruit the kids? So think about what the assumptions are behind that question. There is such a conversation in our culture about young people being disaffected, uninterested, blah, 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 blah. We have found exactly the opposite. Young people are no different than you and I. They have the same deep longing to make a difference and to be part of their community as everybody else does. And we have four operating principles at Ceres, and one of them is young people are intelligent, responsible, capable, creative, and caring, and must be central participants in creating our collective future. Catherine Couch is an entrepreneur, chef, activist, and former director of communications for The Hunger Project. In 2006, when she learned a woman in her community was struggling with stage 4 breast cancer, she cooked healthful meals and delivered them to the family. That experience inspired her to launch the Series Community Project, a youth empowerment program that provides almost 100,000 healthy meals a year to seriously ill, low-income patients in Sonoma County. Catherine Couch spoke at a Bioneers conference. The model is we bring teenagers into the kitchen, and now also a garden, and we prepare 100% organic whole food meals for primarily very low-income people in our community that are dealing with a health crisis. We engage over 1,000 volunteers a year in that work, and we use it as a platform to talk about the connection between food and health and what a healthy food system actually looks like. We take on a new client. They receive 8 to 24 weeks of meals for everyone in the family, four complete dinners, a pint each of soup and salad, a healthy dessert, and then what we call extras. These are all food-based products. Many of them also have medicinal herbs in them. And then basic nutrition education. So if you're going through cancer treatment, you are not a good candidate for let me teach you everything you need to know about healthy eating. Eating is not at the top of your list most of the time, and you know you should. So our thought is, if it's not beautiful, they're not going to take that first bite. If it's not delicious, they're not going to keep eating it. And if it's not nourishing, they shouldn't be eating it at all. So what we do is we build in just little bits of information that help the patients connect the dots between what we're sending them and their health. I love the permaculture concept of stacking functions, and that's what we've tried to do in this model. We've tried to figure out all of the impacts that we can build into a model that all of us are familiar with, right? Everybody's familiar with Meals on Wheels, people making meals and delivering them to people who need them. And we've tried to take that model and figure out how to build as much transformation and positive impact as we can. Over the years, Catherine Couch has seen the transformative effect the program has on the youth who participate. So we bring them into a kitchen and we put them in what we call the most important job, which is making the meals for our clients. And they're empowered with that job. They're supported by adult mentors, by staff, but they are the primary chefs and gardeners in the program. They commit to a minimum of three hours a week for three months. The average teen is involved for a year, many for three, four, five years. They start at the end of eighth grade and stay all the way through high school. We have a teen leader program. We have two teens who serve as full voting members on our board of directors. And we're really, really committed to empowering young people to become the activists that we need for the next generation. They all learn to cook and eat kale, which I like to say. And that's not where the transformation is. The transformation is we do a teen ed program, so half an hour of every shift. We're talking about nutrition education and food systems education. But about every 12 weeks, we do a two-week block where clients come in every day. And so every single young person that we work with has had multiple people look at them and say, thank you for helping save my life. That's where transformation happens, when we tap into that in ourselves, right? Our ability to make a difference in the world around us, that's the core power of our model for the teen side of our work. Catherine Couch has even higher aspirations for series. At the heart is youth job creation and social service for some of the most vulnerable in society. The group formed a partnership with a housing community at the old converted naval base run by the nonprofit Alameda Point Collaborative. About 200 families live there, including 250 children. Every family was previously homeless and has an adult who's permanently disabled. Young residents are invited to participate in an after-school program in the on-site kitchen to make healthy meals for the residents. 
Ceres also trains federally run health clinics and other service organizations to incorporate healthy food into their programs. One provides veterans going through cancer treatments with the healthy meals and nourishment they so desperately need. Catherine Couch says the nourishment goes far beyond the food itself. And what we found is that this is with clients getting an average of 14 weeks of meals when they were surveyed three months after leaving the program, had increased fruit and vegetable consumption by 23%. 75% had reduced the amount of fast and processed food and white flour and white sugar that they're eating. And 82% of clients had weight move in a positive direction. 100% said the food helped them recover. So this is what happens, right? You get diagnosed with a serious illness. You are more motivated than you have probably ever been in your life to change your diet. And then what happens when you come to series is for 8, 12, 16 weeks, you're getting these incredible, beautiful, delicious, nourishing meals. You get familiar with food that you weren't familiar with. You realize that it actually does taste good. And most importantly, that you feel better when you're eating this way. So 93%, they learn that healthy eating helps them feel better. And then 93% say that we helped reduce the social isolation that they felt. On the teen side, 50% more teens are encouraging their friends and family to make healthier choices, and 28% increase in the number of kids who are cooking at home. So this is a model that's now been replicated in a number of communities around the country and has the potential to be used in a lot of very, very interesting situations where, where a population has a very high degree of chronic illness, and we can bring together intergenerationally young people empower them to make food for people in their community and begin to transform the relationship that that community has with food and with health. As Catherine Couch and Malik Yakini are proving, transformational change is arising by meeting this basic human need through building community. They're replacing the sad diet with compassion, justice, health, and dignity, because food can be medicine that also heals the community. When we return, we hear from Oren Hesterman about the ingenious innovations of the Fair Food Network and more from Malik Yakini and Catherine Couch on what love's got to do with it. This is a nourishing future, creating a just and healthy food system. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. To explore all available Bioneers radio shows, podcasts, and video programming, and to hear more from Malik Yakini and Catherine Couch, please visit Bioneers.org. We need to reimagine what this food system could look like. We have to grab the potential of food to transform our lives, our towns, our cities, our communities, and our planet. And it's not just about realizing potential. It's an absolute necessity for our future. Oren Hesterman has spent his life reimagining the food system. He's a trained agronomist and professor of agronomy. For over a decade, he served as director of the Kellogg Foundation's Food and Society Program, where he became deeply committed to food justice and racial justice. As a fellow Michigander, he's a colleague of Malik Yakini. He's the author of Fair Food, Growing a Healthy, Sustainable Food System for All. Oren Hesterman founded the Fair Food Network to provide breakthrough alternatives based in systems thinking, a solve-the-whole-problem approach. One of its most successful programs directly helps people struggling to put food on the table, much less healthy food. It's called Double Up Food Bucks. The way Double Up Food Bucks works is that anybody with an EBT, Electronic Benefits Transfer Card, used to be food stamps, It's now called EBT, or SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's a federal program. Anybody with an EBT card can come to a participating farmer's market and double their money if they spend their food assistance dollars on locally grown fruits and vegetables. So you go to a farmer's market, you spend $20 of your food assistance money, you get $40 worth of produce that you bring home. 
We started with five farmers markets in Detroit back in 2009. The program is now in over 150 farmers markets across the state, and we are starting to operate in grocery stores. So 20 grocery stores now have this program as well in the state of Michigan. 90% of Michigan residents live in a county where this program operates now. It's not perfect. Access is still an issue we have to grapple with, but we know that it's actually working. Double Up Food Bucks has helped bring Michigan to number three in the nation for SNAP sales at farmer's markets. Only California and New York are ahead of Michigan now. We're really proud of the program. It's put about $7 million into the pocket of farmers selling at farmer's markets since we started the program, money that wouldn't have been there without this program, bringing new customers into the market. It's a win-win-win, right? It's not solving one problem at a time. Families are bringing home more healthy food. Farmers are putting more money in their pockets and more food dollars are staying in the local economy. And all of these three have ripple positive benefits in the community. We're simultaneously addressing both supply and demand, both affordability and access, and generating multiple wins at the same time. Oren Hesterman says expanding model programs like Double Up Food Bucks across the country can change the game. After all, SNAPS is the single largest line item in the U.S. federal food and agriculture budget, averaging $75 billion annually. He believes that allowing as many families as possible to double their value at farmer's markets and other healthy community-based outlets is one more piece of the fair food puzzle. The Fair Food Network is also involved in Michigan's innovative Good Food Fund. It's providing financing and business opportunities to food enterprises that benefit underserved communities across the state by building an alternative fair food economy. And this kind of business model is springing up across the country. And that is a, another public-private partnership putting together a pool of funds that can be used to finance businesses. And in the Michigan Good Food Fund, there are expressed conditions for borrowing money that have to do with how embedded is the business in the community, how many high-quality jobs are being created, in what ways is racial and social equity being addressed by that business. So really a different model of creating access to capital than what we've seen before. Another model to check out is called The Daily Table. It's a nonprofit grocery store that was just created in Dorchester, Massachusetts, one of the lowest income neighborhoods in Boston. It was created actually by the former CEO of Trader Joe's. If you go in the grocery store, you're going to find, you know, sell by dates on most food. Well, most people think that that's the expiration date after which the food's no good, and that's not true. The FDA does not insist that food companies put sell by dates and, and by then you have to get rid of the food. It's a guidance that food companies are putting on for the retailer. But large retailers are not going to keep food on the shelf if the sell-by date is tomorrow or the next day or the next day because they know customers aren't going to buy it. So what's happening is Doug Rao is getting these large grocery chains, food companies, to donate the food rather than throwing it out because a lot of that food that's either close to or at the sell-by date ends up in the landfill. They're taking that food, some of it they're repackaging, and a lot of it they're putting into preparing healthy meals and selling it for very reasonable cost to the residents of that community. Oren Hesterman, Malik Yakini, and the widespread grassroots efforts in Detroit are helping change how local state leadership views the food movement. Detroit is beginning to see how urban agriculture and innovative food programs can serve as an economic driver and add value to the city. The municipal government is increasing access for urban growers to city-owned land. Malik Yakini and the Black Community Food Security Network have plenty more plans. One is the Detroit People's Food Co-op to be owned by the community as an alternative to the capitalist model that he believes has failed Detroit and the country so badly. He sees very different values taking root. So... For us, the values that guide our work are love, and the love that we have is a love for creation and a love for all life and an understanding that all of these things are interconnected. 
And so we love all of humanity. And then the second value that guides our work is justice. If work is not proceeding from a justice framework, then it's meaningless. We're not interested in replicating systems of inequity and systems of oppression, but we're interested in justice for all human beings and justice for all living things. Catherine Couch. Food is an incredible vehicle for communicating love. And when I started series in 2007, in the first year, we got all these love notes from our clients. And, and what we heard was, I can feel the love in the food. And the second thing we heard was, my friends were cooking for me, my family was cooking for me, and that was really wonderful. But to know that all these people who don't even know me are making this food happen for me, it feels like the whole community cares. And there's a really powerful piece around that, right, of feeling connected not only to others, but to the community that really happens through this model. Thank you so much. A Nourishing Future, Creating a Just and Healthy Food System, with food system visionaries Malik Yakini, Catherine Couch, and Oren Hesterman. You can see and hear more from Malik Yakini and Catherine Couch and explore more Bioneers radio programs, podcasts, and videos online at Bioneers.org. For information on attending the National Bioneers Conference and Bioneers events in your area, please visit Bioneers.org or call 1-877-BIONEER. The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ausubel. Written by Kenny Ausubel. Senior producer and station relations, Stephanie Welch. Host and consulting producer, Neil Harvey. Production assistants, Emily Harris. Interview recording engineer, Jeff Westman. Our theme music is co-written by the Baca Forest people of Cameroon and Baca Beyond from the album East to West. All royalties from Baca compositions and performances go to the Baca Forest people through the charity Global Music Exchange. Find out more at globalmusicexchange.org. Additional music was made available by Sounds True at soundstrue.com. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 1116.